Welcome to another edition of Grace Under Pressure, where my guest today is Lisa Norell. I'll tell you all about her in just a moment. Grace Under Pressure is an interview show that poses questions to thought leaders and doers like Lisa. And we talk about grace, which is too often dismissed as the soft stuff, the caring, the connecting, and the commitment we feel toward others. Uh, grace for me is generosity. We show compassion and respect. And when you do it as a leader, it means you bring people together for common cause and you energize them for joint shared vision. Welcome, Lisa. It is an honor to have you on my show today. So. Oh, it's great to be here today, John. Well, you are someone I admire. You are a fellow member of Marshall Goldsmith 100 Coaches, and you are an expert marketer. You are the Chief Energy of Officer. Don't you like that title? Chief Energy Officer at Energy Energize Growth. She's worked with big companies like Adobe, Qualcomm, Google, and they ask her, Lisa, to develop new strategies and launch breakthrough marketing ideas. She is also an exceptional um, executive coach and she works with senior uh, leaders, often in marketing. She is also an author and uh, a live stream host. Her mission is to help marketing leaders build sustainable companies and more fulfilling lives. Welcome, Lisa Norell. So what are we going to dive into today, John? We've got so much we could unpack. Yeah. Well, there's so much going on in our world. So you have a phrase, which I like, mindful marketing. What does that mean, Lisa? So, Mindful Marketer is my latest book, The Mindful Marketer, How to Be Present and Profitable in a Data-Driven World. And I see mindfulness and define it as non-judgmental present moment awareness. And being able to just stay in the moment and look at what's in front of you with compassion and acceptance and determine what to do next or what not to do next. Great. And marketing is the, is the other half of that. And the definition of marketing has not really changed much for me over the years. It's still being able to educate, inform, and inspire your audience to take positive action. Okay. We are now in a world of digital presence. So how does mindfulness play into that? And you also talked about the data. So those are, that data is a cold analytical field. So what does it mean to be present and in this kind of environment, Lisa, so. Well, let me give you an example just to illustrate that. I'm in my studies as I was putting together my book, I met a woman who once led a marketing team out of Massachusetts for TripAdvisor. You've, you've probably oh, yeah. used TripAdvisor once or twice in your life. Sure. And she had a inherited a group of marketing people and what she realized is they were very strong on data, but very weak on employee engagement. And you know, you can't engage employees by using robots and spreadsheets. <laughs> so she, That's a good you know, one. Some, some of the things I'm gonna share here are a bit controversial and I understand that. So I always tell people, take what you need and leave the rest <laughs> and just try on what works for you. And what she realized is that there was so much focus on data. There was so much excellent focus on dashboards and performance management, but her team had lost their passion and their mojo for working together and being effective teammates. Mm -hmm. So what she did is she put a lot of time and energy into how she designed her team gatherings. And she started to take people to art galleries as a team initiative. And she had a rule. She said, when you come to my meetings, you have to put your mobile devices in that bucket over there. And Nothing wrong with that. I will not argue with and, that. Right. And you're not going to be checking emails and checking your phone while we're talking. And uh, we're going to just be fully present for each other. And it worked. And she saw a 20% improvement in employee engagement scores and very high retention of her best people. So I believe that stories combined with data 
are a marketer's secret weapon. But you can't have one without the other. No, and I, I um, in one of the books I wrote, how great leaders or how leaders get great results. Um, I talk; it's it's a theme in there of storytelling, and I said that um, numbers tell a story, and so data tells a story. So, how does one make a story out of data? If you so. I go back to look at if you're in marketing. In other words. My idea of if you're in marketing is if you interact with any clients or customers, guess what? You're in marketing. Um, <laughs> that's a pretty and, broad definition. I think that's about uh, uh, almost every member of LinkedIn would probably fall into that category. So, Right. If we're not marketing for our companies for whom we work, chances are we have to do some personal branding and represent ourselves and be effective at marketing our superpowers, aren't we? I mean, that's just as important. And so when I'm working with clients, I say um, one of the things when I'm coaching clients is we do a, an inventory, and I have an actual exercise we go through to find out, tell me about six or seven of your peak moments in your life. Mm -hmm. And tell me who was involved. Did you help somebody? Were you serving somebody? Were you talking to a customer or a board of directors? What did you accomplish? What did they say, think, or feel? And what were you most excited about from that particular experience? Because we want to be able to eventually pick a couple of those and develop what I affectionately call your signature story that would get people interested and say, John, that is really quite an accomplishment. Tell me more. Absolutely. I love that a signature story. That Now that falls into personal branding. Am I correct? Is there such a thing as signature stories for a company. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. And when uh, when I work with clients, I oftentimes will team up as I'm doing now. I have a billion dollar client that has to rewrite the story around how they interact with their customers. When does someone become a member of their so-called audience, which is their email list. Uh, one of the biggest trends right now that we're seeing in marketing as all of these new privacy rules get launched in 2022 is it's becoming much more incumbent on really good marketers to own their first party data as opposed to do Facebook ads, Google ads, et cetera, because they're slowly losing data quality through those other avenues. So when they're putting together their, their email newsletters or outreach to their given audience, we're finding that the best companies are really, really good at telling great stories to, an, to the people who are not yet customers, to invite them to subscribe to their live streams, their newsletters, or maybe eventually get into a sales conversation with them. And uh, one of my favorite examples is the head of growth at the New York Times. Lori does that brilliantly. Oh, that's great. Now, that's a wonderful thing that you said. And, um, and now I, I buy into the whole thing. But here's the thing. And you said the operative word. Customers or uh, clients, companies, tell their best stories to their um people that haven't worked with them or haven't, haven't patronized them. So where does that leave longtime patrons of companies? So because, so you know, the old joke or not the joke, but the worst thing to be is, is a customer of your uh, telco company. You know, the best, the best thing you can do is to switch telco companies and you'll get a free phone. So what do you advise companies about that, Lisa? So. I turn to a company like Salesforce. Yeah. Just check, check out what they do with their longstanding customers. I first met Erica Cool back in 2015. Erica is a pioneer in the world of helping technology companies build branded customer online communities. And she is a genius. So back in 2015, by the time she built that community at Salesforce, they had 1.5 million customers on the platform. And they found out a couple things, one of which was, did you know that 
if you are a member of their customer community and you're you're nurtured and you get attention and they have special events for you, you will spend 15% more than a non-member of the community. And it is now 2021, as you and I are speaking, they have grown that community to 11.5 million members. That's quite a growth. Thing. So if anyone wonders about the butterfly effect of revenue, look at look no further than Salesforce because Mark Benioff has done an amazing job at holding on to customers and more importantly, making them feel like they matter. Right. I'll tell you another company I think has done a very good job in that. It's um, Zoom. Um, the CEO of Zoom had even prior to or prior to the pandemic had been sending out weekly newsletters and chats and listen and make you feel like we're special. Now everything <laughs> is their business just went through the roof in ways never, ever dreamt of uh, in ways that so uh, building that community is tough, but holding on to it. And I think so often, and that's why we have good people like you to remind us that customers don't grow on trees. They have options. And so we need to take care of our customers. So does mindfulness, um, that mindset help us do that, Lisa? So. Yes. And if you ever feel like you're getting lost, I can point people to my website. I have a free mindful marketer quiz and I look at 20 different areas where you can, even if your marketing is considered pretty good, you know, maybe you can make it even stronger. And of those 20 key areas, I'll give you a couple if this would be helpful for, for our audience right now. Learning from you is always helpful, Lisa. You have taught me, so please teach away. Uh. Well, one of the areas that I really uh, challenge you to look at within your marketing culture, or again, any of the members of your organization who talk to customers, this is a really important point. And if you forget everything else, I hope you'll remember this, that this is the time to embrace a mindset of curiosity and experimentation. Look, John, we're still in the middle of a pandemic, right? So in this pandemic, how many of us within the 100 Coaches community can proudly say, I have experimented with some new marketing strategies. Some of them worked out, some of them didn't work out. And you know what? That's okay. But we're going to keep the ones that work. We're going to throw out the ones that didn't. You know, they didn't break the bank. We, we tried it in a few select markets or select audiences, and we're going to keep doing. Like for me, I tried five or six different things last year. One that really stuck were my live streams. Mm -hmm. So I'm coming up on my 37th live stream. And we started, we'd have four people show up for the live stream. Yeah. <laughs> last week, we had 592. So I'm pretty happy with that. You, you know, be I'm very like, happy with that. So. I'm really honored that, okay, we're delivering a lot of value. Now, there were a couple of things I tried last year, didn't go so well, don't need to do those again. So that's the first thing. Be, embrace experimentation and curiosity versus, you know, we're going to do this for 12 months and we're going to double down. And yeah, this is a great time to experiment. What, what are your thoughts on that, John? I'm supposed to be asking the questions. You're not supposed to ask me those questions, Lisa. <laughs> Uh, no, and I'm glad. Absolutely, uh, uh, the, you know the adage of uh, "never let a crisis go to waste" it has never been more true than now. But let's uh, and the idea of experimentation is true because really, I mean, we're living in a time of great ambiguity. There isn't any clear path. I think now we can see the end with vaccination rates going up. We can see a light at the end of the tunnel, and it's not a train. But no, things are unsettled, and I'm, I like your idea of experimentation. So if we even take the idea of the hybrid workplace, and this is something I do, you asked me earlier about what are my clients thinking. Um, the advice is plan for going back to the hybrid, whatever, but realize that whatever you decide to do, Lisa, you're probably going to change again. Would you not agree with that? I'm so. I absolutely see that. I, one of my favorite acronyms of the season is VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And, it, you know, it's like, hello, VUCA. This is where we're at. And nobody's shooting at us. 
So <laughs> let's all calm down. Yeah. Let's make sure we have a sense of humor and play about this because um, this is the way it's going to be for a while. Right. And, um, and we want to hire people who are able to also adapt to that. Well, you know, I'm glad you mentioned that, Lisa. I was on an empathy concert yesterday with our colleague, um, Elliot Massey, who's been doing, Elliot is called the father of uh, e-learning. Well, before there was even an e, he's been doing this for decades. But he has an avocation, which is a, as a Broadway producer. And of course, Broadway has been shut down. So what Elliot, not letting that stop him, he has done like you, uh, started these empathy concerts where he has uh, Broadway performers come on and perform and what a great avenue and talking to them i mean talk about a, folks whose world has been turned upside down you and i have had the ability to adapt but uh <clears throat> the government didn't tell us lisa you can't go to work well essentially that's what happened to the theater community you can't uh perform in front of a live audience and that not being malicious or anything but we needed to do it for public health reasons but yet these performers have persevered, just like you said. Um, and uh, and I think the always crisis produces talent. I mean, brings out talent. And so, uh, and I'm uh, that's something I'm passionate about, and I know you are too, as far as experimentation. So, yes. So go experiment with the twenty point quiz um, on my website. I just, in case anyone wants it, I put it in the chat for people to take it takes four to five minutes and it might give you some other ideas on how you can embrace our time of vuca right um i whenever i hear vuca i think of the uh, the navy term and it came uh which is kavu uh ceiling uh attained visibility unlimited so uh that's kind of the opposite of where we are in vuca so in other words and we're going to get to kavu <laughs> one of these days um and but it's it's this trying we have to uh, we have to challenge ourselves but yeah we have to work together and find new things so um tell us about the the human side of big data when you when you meet with clients and they you know, they're in love with their data and their data analytics is fine so but you say there's something more am i correct so oh my goodness there's something more I, in my book i dedicate at least half of the chapters to helping marketing professionals build better relationships with other departments. Nowadays, to be a great marketer, some mornings you will have to wear your IT hat. Other mornings you're going to have to go and sit in on customer calls with the vice president of sales. Uh, sometimes you're going to have to make friends with or embrace owning the customer experience function. So. I host private CMO groups for US-based marketing leaders. And I have noticed in the last two years, close to half of them now own the responsibility for the customer experience function. So we need to take a broader look. And remember one other thing that I think I've learned so aptly from both uh, Sally Helgeson and Marshall Goldsmith is that as you move up the ladder in your organization, you are not going to be judged based on your technical skills and your understanding of big data. <laughs> you are going to be judged on your ability to cultivate long-term relationships. Without question. And, and, and there's an old adage in HR, which says IQ gets you hired. EQ your ability to rate, relate to others gets you promoted. And it's just what you said. And I like your idea about marketers taking the initiative and going out and seeing, uh, if, uh, experiencing other functions. That gives them a broader depth, does it not? So, yeah. Most definitely, most definitely. And uh, approximately in our broad community now, of 14,000 chief marketing officers and marketing professionals we're finding that it's getting much closer now to approximately 50% of those key leaders now own a piece of the revenue goals for their organizations. And I think we're going to see that continue to grow. But 10 years ago, when I started my CMO peer groups, maybe 10% 
had sure. revenue responsibilities. Right. So if you're hiding behind focus groups or surveys <laughs> or spreadsheets with your key performance indicators, right. it's time to make some white space on your calendar and go listen in on some actual customer meetings, sales calls, and go to some safe hybrid trade shows to listen to what they're saying, what they're not saying, and how they're feeling. I mean, what you're saying, um, uh, Lisa, is such common sense. But as our colleague Martin Lindstrom says, common sense, as he wrote in his wonderful new book, The Ministry of Common Sense, uh, is not so common. So what's holding uh, what you say is seems very logical. What do you think is holding marketers back from doing from um, uh, staying in their own silo? So. Well, let's think about one of my wonderful clients who works for a very prominent technology company. And Alex came to me and said, well, I'm ready for coaching. Let's get this coaching engagement started. And I said, well, tell me what you're doing right now in terms of professional development and learning. Mm -hmm. And Alex said to me, oh, you're going to be so proud of me. I have a list of 50 books on how to be a better marketer. They're all books on marketing. And I am gonna get, I am gonna get my arms around all this stuff. Big data, artificial intelligence, the internet of things, um, sales, you know, everything. And um, I said, okay, well, first of all, I invite you to stop that right now and just reconsider that maybe you've read fewer books and schedule more meetings with some of your greatest internal team members where you can really make a difference and deepen those relationships. And how, and how did that go over? So. Well, Alex is a great coaching client because they're lifelong learners, they're curious, and they're willing to try things, try new things and get uncomfortable. So they did a great job well, and they re reconsidered. Now, you have something as part of the Mindful Marketer called the Middle Path, which is um, how do you uh, create this between market acceleration and marketing mindfulness? What is the what is the middle path in that, Lisa? So. I understand how Western business works. I have been working in the corporate world for over 31 years. I started my in high school. I want to. I did to know that you started in high school. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to tell you that um, I understand because I all of my roles before I started my own business almost 20, whew, 20 years ago, John, mm -hmm. 20 years ago. That was that, um, that was when uh, high school graduation. So, <laughs> yes, exactly. And uh, I like the way you think <laughs> and tell me where to send the check. Yeah. And <laughs> no, you, are a, you are a wise woman. And, and you know, I think back to what it took for me to build my career. Every single position I had, I had profit and loss responsibility. I had quotas. I had essentially greenfield sales territories or markets where they said, we don't know if there is a there there. We don't even know if there are any customers out there. Here's a list of accounts. Go have fun. Oh, and we sell 45 different high-end technology products or solutions. So good luck. Go go learn how to use, you know, what these products are all about. So I did really well in those environments, right? Just give me a big vision and I'll figure out the rest. And so I understand there is a middle path. I understand that sitting on the top of a mountain and meditating is not gonna help marketing leaders be more effective. <laughs> we need to get our hands dirty. We need to take our best mindsets and best selves into every interaction. And the middle path is to say, all right, how can I be my best self today with these customers or stakeholders and stay grounded and focused so that I don't react, fly off the handle, lose my temper, take things personally, stop learning, you know. And I, in my book, I have numerous tips and examples at the end of every chapter on how 
You can be a mindful marketer, some specific habits. Like one simple habit, I've got this notebook, John. Oh, this is my notebook. I don't use Evernote, okay? I use these cheap little notebooks and I have piles of them. Yeah. But before every important meeting, I sit down and I write my min max. I set my intention for the meeting. Right. What is the minimum best outcome? What is the maximum best outcome? So that that person gets value. I'm helpful in some way. You ask me about grace. I try to act with grace, even in the most contentious of customer or client conversations. But I write down my intentions versus, oh my gosh, John, we have a meeting right now. Uh, why are we having this meeting again? I forget. I, what was I supposed to prepare something? I, I don't remember. Yeah. Like, All right. I do my very best to show up with intention. Okay. You know, I, I was teasing you about your about your length of service, and and hearing you explain that, you come across as a very wise person. But you are not in stasis, um, and your title, Chief Energy Office, belies what it is that you do, uh, because you are relentlessly creative and energetic, and your enthusiasm is contagious. And that's why you're such a successful coach, because people can't help but say, oh, if, if Lisa buys into this, I, I'm excited about it, too. And that's a real gift, Lisa. So I want to give you a shout out for that. So. Thank you. Thank you. I, well, you don't see me behind the scenes. Believe me, I make plenty of time to relax, to sit outside and listen to the birds, mm -hmm. to meditate. I, I didn't meditate this morning, which was unusual. Um, well, you do have a just, hobby that is quite extraordinary, <laughs> and you've been doing it uh, long distance swimming. Am I correct? So. I started when I was about five, much to the chagrin of my mother, who would stand on the shore and freak out and say, why are you swimming across the lake? You're five years old. But I never had any fear of the water, and I still don't. Yeah. Well, that's extraordinary. So we, sadly, we are coming to the end of our show. And I did, as I ask all guests, a story of grace, and you touched on it. Is there something special, additional you want to share with us, Lisa? So. Yes, I would say look at grace and mindful marketing as very complementary ways of operating in the world. Mm -hmm. Not only will your customers and stakeholders be better off, but so will you. And every time I talk to a client, they treat me with grace. They listen to my ideas. Even if they don't implement all the ideas, it's all good because we both agree psychically that we're going to treat each other with grace and mutual respect and it's one of our core values well that's it's the mutuality that does it the reason if you are sensing that people are treating you with grace that's because how you come across to them and you are a woman of grace i know that you have a generous spirit um otherwise you wouldn't even come on this show with me <laughs> so uh, i am indebted to your grace so Thank you. Uh, Lisa, how can it's we find you? It's a pleasure. You? How can we find you? So. Well, I'd like everyone to just feel free to send me an email to lisa at lisanorell.com. And let me know if you're interested in following my work. I've got a, as I said, I have a mindful market or quiz. And I also have a bonus page, which maybe you could put in the show notes, which is themindfulmarketer.com mm -hmm. forward slash bonus and people can receive six different tools, videos, and checklists to help them adapt to this new reality we call preparation for post-pandemic world. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, we will definitely put those in the notes. And I thank you, Lisa. It's been a pleasure to have you on the show. Your energy is contagious, and I'm grateful to know you. So thank you, Lisa. So. I am honored, John. It's great to see you as always. Thanks. Yeah.